Um, you know what? Uh, for the longest time, the, the podcasts have started with this intro thing, and I think that's going to go away. Kind of just keep it a little <laughs> more casual. Uh, Jeff Burrows, uh, anybody watching this knows exactly who you are of the Tea Party. Uh, thanks for hanging out, bud. Um, started this conversation up in Montreal. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and now have managed to come back to Windsor to finish it's off like our solo. The, the hardest one to tag down is the guy you live like 20 blocks from. <laughs> it's true from the whole, ble- <laughs> for the whole band, right? Like yeah. it's a band who or, originates from the area and we got to travel all the way to, around the country to get you. But I'm so glad we got the opportunity to do that. So thanks for helping arrange all yeah, that. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah, <laughs> fun trip. Cause we were in Vancouver, flew in for that one, uh, private for show. One show. Yeah. And then zipped around. Yeah, you guys, it's it's amazing because like I've only I've been aware of you obviously my entire life. I think I told you you ended up buying a friend of mine's house out River Canard. Oh, right? way back. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, I've been aware of you my entire life, but it's only been in like the last year that I've spent any time around you and just sort of seen what your world is like. Disappointing, eh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go with disappointing. It's it's. I think people who don't know you. Yeah. Um, who have a outside perception of you would not understand what your day to day is even closely. Yeah, like even even a little bit. Um, it, it's you you jump from one project to another project. You've got a lot of stuff on the go, and now Tea Party coming back. All of this stuff. Talk to me a little bit about how you're just even managing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I got a great wife, um, great kids, a huge support system like such as yourself and um, whether it's the tea party or at this time of year, uh, the saints right. that we do. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, it, it, it's who you surround yourself with. It really is. And it always has been. And I learned that at a very early age, I was told and I would always ask myself, you know, be that person that people want to go to and surround yourself with people that you may want to go to for help. And it's a reciprocal thing. So I've, I've in, in the last 10 plus years, I've noticed, or yeah, way more than that, maybe 20 years. Um, I love the aspect of community and I love the aspect of helping within your community and that whole surrounding yourself with the right people. There's always these, these niches within each community that are, you know, super prone to help children with cancer or super prone to be helping with uh, the theater community. And there's all of these, you know, unlabeled nuggets of wonderfulness that help keep a community going, like thriving, like WIF, for instance, the, the film festival. It wouldn't happen without that crazy group that just go 72 hours nonstop and all volunteers and and hats off to that or the blues fest for example which i'm a part of and and rob and carol petroni and the entire staff of volunteers you you end up surrounding yourself in these groups and they ask you to become part of it and that was one of the instances i was honored and i'm like why would you want me and just simply i've played a lot of festivals i know what it's like to be backstage you know what it's like to give the artists that come into our community um, the proper vision of what it's like to be welcomed into our community. And a lot of people forget about that. So they brought me in and I let the artists know all about our town, what it's like to be a guest at our festival. You get top notch everything and so on and so forth. So whether it's something like that, whether it's um, a charitable commitment or an event that I'm helping organize or organizing myself, it's always because you're surrounded with the best, most generous people. And, and I try to reciprocate that as much as I can. It, it's funny because when, when you said, why do you want me? Mm-hmm. I almost get the feeling because you got involved with, with them later. Like you, you already had a career. I think the Tea Party was, was on a break when you got, started getting involved with them, right? With Blues Fest? With Blues Fest. No, no, this wasn't until... Four years ago. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so even then, like you, you, you've come through the industry, mm-hmm. right? I guess my question to you is, when when you have somebody come to you and say, "Hey, help us out with this," you're for, when you when you're when you question, "Why do you want me?" Is some of that like, well, "Why do you want me?" Yeah, you don't want. I mean, with the modicum amount of fame that we've accomplished, sometimes <laughs> you'll you'll get requests that you know are a little off-putting or or you know 
seriously, why me? Because how am I going to help that? Or I'm sorry, I understand this is a very difficult time or an event that you're trying to do, but it's in Welland, Ontario. And you, you know what I mean? I can't just can't be everywhere make it happen for everyone, for everything. And um, yeah, so I always, I always say, why me? Yeah. And when I ask someone to help me, I tell them exactly why I want them to help me. Right. I think your services would be really good. And I'm a barterer. It, it's right. great. I mean, I could survive easily without the monetary <laughs> system because I'll, I'll give you two goats. <laughs> if you help me acquire some of these gift certificates for my event, because you have connections in that. You know what I mean? So is that a natural thing for you? Is that, that, that been all your life? No, I've no? grown into it yeah. in 20 years. Again, it's who you surround yourself with. Like, there's some professional fundraisers out there that know what to do, where to go. The and, and the thing is, too, is, I mean, there's a whole system to all of this that you don't want. I've got friends who shall remain nameless, and they know who they are, but they make donations to almost anything that I'm putting on. They know where the money is going. They're getting their tax receipts, and they want to be a part of the community. And they like our sort of events because they're either normally music-based or this, you know what I mean, entertainment-based. Um, so, you know, you, you always have to just be a little bit, you know, just to pump the brake a little bit before you make a decision. Right. Yeah. You you uh, you first said that you learned very early on mm-hmm. about sort of like being part of community. Where did they come from? All my folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. My my dad, a drummer, coached baseball. Didn't really even play baseball, and and turned us into all stars in in LaSalle at at the Turtle Club. Um, never skated in his life. Became the president voluntarily of Sandwich West Hockey before it was LaSalle South Hockey, um, just to be a part of the community. And that's a lot. Like a lot of people, um, and my mom, for example, who's just the most giving person in the world, and my dad's mom, my late Nana, she used to raise money for seniors, which was called the Sunshine Bus, and they would go on trips, and that was a big inspiration. So, all you know, you get you get it from everywhere and from everyone, but. I think for me, once we started having success at what we loved to do as a band, as the Tea Party, um, I'm I'm very grateful. And oftentimes I, you know, have to smack myself in the head and, and, you know, wake myself up a little bit and realize the fact that, you know, a lot of people are unhappy with what they have to do to make a living and put food on their table. They love their family so much and they'll give anything and they'll sacrifice anything. Not to say that being in a band, touring all the time doesn't come with its sacrifices, but you're in a pretty blessed position to be able to do that. And I've always felt that it's it's my obligation. And it's not an obligation for every athlete or every entertainer. It's not. It, they, they don't owe anyone anything. But in my mind frame, I feel that I owe to, to give back because I've been very lucky and very blessed. And it's a simple thought, simple equation. But it, I always figure, why not? Because what else would I be doing? I mean, I could be doing a lot of other things, but why not be a little more selfless and include a group of people and meet more people and, 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 right? Well, it's it, it's funny because you say that. It's the and, and, and part that fascinates me yeah. the most because it's not like you have a bunch of time. Like that's one of like that's one of the things that that really sort of stands out to me because like just being in not that I've been involved in your world but I've sort of I've seen what's happening around with you over the past year or whatever and seeing you in different places in different versions of who you are yeah, yeah. and there's so much and it's constant but you you're in this world where from outside of that it's like oh rock star just fuck whatever you know yeah like, no it's not it's not like that and. It, and it's true. I, I love being busy. Mm. And then I'll catch myself complaining about the fact that I'm busy. I think I was doing that earlier, wasn't I? <laughs> and then um, the moment I have two days, I'm thinking, you know, devil will find work for idle hands to do. So find me something to do. Is there, is there an element <laughs> yeah. of that? Like, do you, do you get stir crazy if you don't have anything going Very on? Very much. Yeah. I find it really hard even going on vacations. But my wife and I have a deal. When we go away on vacation... Because my con- the, the sort of work that I do outside of the Tea Party from fundraising and event planning and raising monies and such, um, it, it's a tw- it is 24-7. Um, 
But so if we do go away on a vacation, you know, the deal is between 4 and 6 p.m. I can get to all my emails, hopefully, and just get short bursts of, of answers going and, and things planned and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I find it hard. <laughs> to do. The best, honestly, the best situation ever. Um, we went to Bob Rock's um, studio in um, Hawaii, in Maui, on Haiku Hill. That's where he lives. And the, it was the best day. Because when was this? Uh, this was for the album Seven Circles, so maybe 2001. I can't remember, sure. but 2001 ish. And we did three songs there. And the day was you'd wake up. I'd wake up earlier, everybody was sleeping. So I'd wake up, have amazing coffee, Kona coffee, and whatever, go for a jog, come back. And then I would just be sitting, having another coffee, feet up. The sun would come, then a cloud would come over and it's lightly spritz on you. And then I'd wake the guys up at 10. We'd go to the beach, we'd boogie board, hilarious. <laughs> we'd come back after an hour and a half, exhausted. Everybody showers up, quick lunch, then we'd go to the studio all day. And you're working with Bob Rock and his amazing engineer, amazing engineer. And we're going over parts and changing things up and then re-recording and just really working on songs that were already written. And that was your day. And then we'd break for dinner and we'd go to this amazing restaurant every time and they had a different fish special every night. So I was like in heaven. And then we would go back to Bob's and then you'd work for three more hours at, and listen to what you've done and what you think might be able to be changed. And for me, it was such a bam, bam, like it was a schedule. I'm a schedule. It's weird because my lifestyle doesn't really require much of a schedule, but I do like the, uh, the relaxation of a schedule. Right. So that though was the best because it had everything. And the only thing that would have made it better is at dinner, my wife was there and we'd be able to go out together and then I can go home and be with her that night and then wake up the next day and she could come jogging with me. That's the only thing right. that was missing. But so far as a, a well laid out, planned, busy day, that was it. And yeah. I was in heaven. Hawaii must not have hurt. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, you're getting mashed on the beach by eight, 12 foot waves with your buddies watching Jeff Martin getting crushed. Right. Up. You I was know. just going to say, one of the funniest mental pictures I've ever had in my life is Jeff Martin on a boogie board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're all quite athletic, though. It's it's pretty fun. Yeah, it's just the idea of the wet hair and the, the boogie. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? His like, hair's thrown back. He's got <laughs> black leather thong bikini right. on it. <laughs> Ty, it. It's funny because you're talking about the studio. You guys have spent some time in some incredibly like historic studios. Yeah. Talk to me about some of that because that's got, like, as a kid coming up, like, throwing the sticks around. Yep. At some point, you got to look around and go, holy fuck. Yeah. Right? Well, so our, so our second album, first album we did in Burlington, Vermont. And I believe EMI, that was our first record with EMI. And I believe they chose that because we were working with engineer producer Glenn Robinson. And Glenn was the son of uh, Mr. Robinson. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Glenn Sr. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but his father um, was known as the man who created and, and made everything Corey Hart, what oh, Corey okay. Hart is. Right. And Glenn had a couple notches in his belt and would work with 13 engines right before us in that studio and it went great. And it was close to Canada and that sort of thing. So that was that one. The second one, we got to go to Los Angeles at A&M. And the band that just left right before, like the day before we were there was Rolling Stones band. I don't know, some band that you were doing a voodoo lounge my album, something like that. Nobody's I don't know. Heard of it but anymore. the studio was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm in the bathroom going, Keith Richard shit. In <laughs> you know what I mean? It was bizarre. And then three days after we had started working in A&M, and while you're there, it's LA, so I called this guy named Ross Garfield. He's known as the drum doctor. You can look him up. Okay. Just Google the drum doctor LA and Ross Garfield will come up. And he owns kits, builds kits. He's got Tommy Lee's big kit, drum kit. He's got everything, right? It's this guy. So he hooked me up with this kit and eventually made me this custom Gretsch kit that I still have. Um, and then Jeff had this guitar tech who was local to them and supplied him with anything he would need. And then three days into it, um, this other guy, uh, Neil Young, I don't know, some Canadian guy did really well, Never heard apparently. Of uh, he was in there in the lounge all the time because he was like just hanging out well he was mixing 
an album he did with his band Pearl Jam. I don't know, Pearl Jams, the Jams, the it's Pearl the, Jams. Okay, the, <laughs> so he yeah. was in there mixing Mirror Ball. Well, you guys with the Pearl Jam record that he did with them while we are in there recording. So we're hanging out with Neil Young. And it was just so that was that one. Is that? <laughs> but is that? It's funny because we're sitting here and telling the stories, and, yeah. and telling the stories is, is ninety percent of the fun for all. Yeah, yeah. But when you're in the moment, like, is were you in the moment, or were you kind of going like, Whoa. I was trying to absorb as much as I could. Um, now every time I smell vanilla nut, vanilla hazelnut coffee, it takes me right back to that specific really? area. And now my wife buys nothing but vanilla nut coffee for me because it was um every time we'd walk into the lounge like you come through the door and neil would be sitting here and his son sitting right there and morning sir how are you doing oh you know not bad and blah, blah, blah. i'm getting a vanilla nut coffee it's the first time we ever tried it right and the smell was emitting and the nose this the sense of smell is one oh, of the biggest you know 100%. what i mean I, I can still smell getting off the plane and walking out the airport in sydney australia for the first time like just different yeah. things that are like wow i remember that you know or the basement of the uh, Horseshoe Tavern in Toronto. <laughs> well, yeah, there's, yeah, certain there's smells you don't, don't want to remember. remember. But. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was a big one. I mean, A and M and A and M, the you know the the background and the history of you know that's Herb Alpert from the right. Tijuana Brass. He was half. He's the A of A and M, and um, just all the other rooms in there. Um, then of course Warren Heights in north of Montreal, where. Rush had done most of their stuff in the 80s there. Uh, David Bowie was there. Uh, Saturday Night Fever was recorded there. It, it, just insane. The Bee Everyone, the Bee Gees to Bowie to Rush to you name it. Every, uh, phenomenal. So we did two, maybe two and a half albums there. Mm -hmm. And um, then, of course, Bob Rock. That, his studio was great because his studio was literally the studio itself probably 20 by 30 foot room nothing big and the drums were actually done in the garage really everyone from tommy lee to lars whomever he was working with if he was in hawaii it was all done in his garage so all decked out garage or is it no, pretty bare bones it was pretty bare bones really and the kit i didn't want to travel with my kit and he says oh i got a dw kit i i used uh a dumbed down version of tommy lee's kit so I just had a 24 kick, probably a standard snare, like 14 by five and a half, and then a 12, 14, 18, or a 12, 16, 18, something like that. And I had all my brass, and we just created this great kit. And it was phenomenal. So that was a lot of fun. And then now, more so than ever, um, we, we work on our own wherever we are. Right. So the EP... It'll be out by the time everyone sees this. But the one that came out on November 29, uh, that was done in Jeff's garage and in Jeff's studio in Australia at his old house. Uh -huh. And then we um, recorded some music that we had written in Vancouver at the Armory because we were there um, doing a private show. So Stuart said, why doesn't everybody fly in early? Jeff can stay at my place. Stuart's got an apartment in, uh, in his attached to his house and then uh, I just stayed in a hotel we met every day we did that and then um, Does technology has technology changed the way you guys work easily yeah easily there's nothing honestly there's nothing better than going to Bob Rocks and you know recording and and you know the, the best board and this that or being at Morin Heights reel to reel tape recording drums on tape and and that sort of thing um, but it's almost unnecessary anymore mm -hmm. But that's why we loved doing the armories. We were so, I think the difference is now is you don't go into a studio and have three quarters of your songs written. And then we're going to work on two or three more while you're there. It, it, it's pointless anymore. We don't have, no one has, unless you're Ed Sheeran, perhaps, um, you know, big recording budgets. Yeah. And at the age that we're at, I'm sorry, I'm not spending X amount of our dollars to not recoup anything, to go out on the road and miss my family. and you know, make less than half of what a school teacher makes. And that you know, still is your dollars too, right? Oh yeah. Like I think that's one of, one of the things that a lot because you guys are you guys are under contract right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so, e universe. but even I think that's one of the misconceptions where people coming up who who haven't really like played in the business. 
think that's a misconception that they have. It's like, oh, well, record company comes in and just pays for everything. It's not. They don't pay no. for it. They might front some stuff, but they it's front, your money. They front you the money. And, I mean, if you're smart, um, you you do it as, um, as quickly as you can. But, you know, as frugally as you can because it's your money at the end of the day. And back in the 90s when everyone was making videos, like even the cheaper videos were well over $150,000. So we ended up with, you know, a massive amount of debt so far as video. And then you're like, is this album cross collateralized with that album? Or are we actually going to make our money on this album because it's separate from that? You know what I mean? There was a whole bunch of business stuff and, and that's kind of just the way it happened. So now, like you said, technology, um, I always get my drums down the way I like them. We spend a lot of times on the drums because I don't want to re-record them and send them. Whereas Stuart, he'll just lay down a basic bass track, but then he wants to start locking with me better. So he'll take the files home. He'll lay his bass down direct, make it sound great. You know, boom, 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 goes back to Jeff. And then we just go on from there. But the, the beauty about the latest one for uh, the 2020 release is that we were ready. We went in, nailed it at the Armory, had a great time. Um, what a great place, too. It's the only Vancouver, of all the Vancouver, because they're quite reputed for their, their studios, it's the only one that was actually built to be a studio. Oh, yeah? You know what I mean? So it was um, Bruce Fairburns, right? Uh, just amazing and great crew and everything. So With with all of the, because you've had, because, I mean, your experience with the Tea Party, then Crash Karma as well. And then, I mean, uh, minor details. You you have a son who's also a performer, so you chase him around as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like you're you're constantly in the move, constantly dealing with all of these different musicians. At the same time, you're from here. Yeah. And you, I, you're aware of of the music scene that's here and the people that are kind of like you know the the locals, right? Yeah. Do Not you, as much as I'd like to be. But do you have a perspective on the difference? What do you mean? So like, so there's, there's because any, I mean, half of the players in, in our city could be doing the business that the tea party does. Right. I mean, it, it making it in, in the industry is, is, it's like making it in any industry. It's, you have to have the tools. You have to be ready. I mean, luck is, you know, when you're prepared and it meets opportunity, that's what luck is. Many people are afforded those opportunities. They're just not, they don't nail it. They're not ready, and you have to be ready, and you have to be willing to sacrifice. I tell this story a lot, and people don't believe me, and it's just a fact. If my wife wasn't a nurse uh, for our first three records, there's no way we would have been able to do this. Like, no way. She paid for our independent record. Um, I was making negative $500 a month uh, for the first four years, all the way up until finally our second album went platinum. Then the band started paying each ourselves $500 a month. And that covered my wife and my small rent per month. That was it. Like it, it and that's wow. 1995. That came out on March 28th of 1995. And we had been doing it since 90. So, you know. It's, it's, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not just, you're not, <laughs> you gotta be able, it, it's a risk. Yeah. Like it was a huge risk. It, it, everything is. Do you, know? you do you do you hold perspective on that time? Like does that does that period of your oh, lifetime yeah. stay in your mind? Yeah, for me, yeah. Yeah. Uh, other people do the things they do however they do it, but no, my wife and I we've had that sort of mindset like now that we've been able to achieve and earn a, a good living doing with what we do and 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 be afforded the time to actually be involved in charities that's another thing right you need the time to be able to be invo involved in those things but we always we don't we take nothing for granted the, i mean the older i get now and the more i'm relaxing a little bit more about my surroundings you know i'll i'll buy myself a little explain that. a little thing but explain that because when you're young and you're in a band and you don't have a pension so anytime we would play and come back from a tour and i would have x I would pull out X for my taxes because you don't receive a check with all your deductions on it. And I would pull out X for the kids um, schooling and I would pull out X for this and X as an investment because I'm not going to have anything when I'm 65. If we just, if I just went on a spree 
during the third, fourth, and fifth album cycles and bought that Ferrari or bought this or that, I'd have nothing right now. So we've always we've always lived well, well within our means because unless you're Nickelback or Shania Twain or Neil Young or Rush or, or something like that, it being in a, a contemporary or slightly than older than contemporary Canadian band like I'm Mother Earth or the Tea Party or Finger Eleven or the Headstones, you're not making a huge, huge living. You're really not. For the amount of time you have to write the songs, record the songs, go on tour, pay the tour, pay the agent, pay the management, pay for the bus, pay for the fuel, pay for everything, and your time away from home, in, and that's a year and a half cycle, you're not making six digits. And that's a year and a half. And you've been doing it now for 30 years. Whereas if I was a teacher with my 30 year, I'd be in six digits and I'd have a pension and I'd be retired in a year or two if I wanted to be. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the difference. And we've always had the perspective of let's take care of that huge foundation, children, home, you know, uh, pen, uh, pension or, or savings funds for when you're old, retirement kind of thing. And it's very on rock and roll and it's really fucking boring. But now, literally, I'm, I'm 51 now. And once, once I turned 50, you know, I sat down with my wife and we went over everything. I think, I think we could breathe now. <laughs> you know what I mean? The yeah. kids are, are, you know, one's living in New York. The other's almost in school. The other one's in college now. And all of that is already taken care of. So, you know, we compartmentalize different things just like uh, anyone should, right. whether you work at Ford or you're a teacher or you're a police officer or a firefighter or or a videographer you you have to take care of this and then put this here put this here and it, it works for me it's, it's simple it's uh very very simple and but it, it's worked that that way and we've you know i don't look like a rock star <laughs> right <laughs> it, it, it's funny because like in a lot of the conversations that i've had on the podcast with with varying levels of 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 artists and musicians, I think a lot of the times the questions that I ask are sort of wrap around like how do you how do you do the things that you do? But I, I think I think what I'm coming on to these days is more along the lines of what interests me about folks like you uh-huh. is not so much because I mean the the music and the the rock star stuff that's cool as shit. Don't get uh-huh. me wrong, but there's only so many of those. Right? Yeah. But I think what's most interesting most interesting about people like you is that you found a creative way to live life. Like yeah. everybody else sort of like waits for rules, kind of waits for a, a list of this is how you do things yeah. and then follows that rule. But folks like you and and other people that have been lucky enough to spend some time with find their like find their own ways to make it in the world. I think I think that's becoming easier now, too, okay. with with the advent of, you know, the Internet and online this and so on. There's there's a lot more. I think opportunity for people to avoid the trappings of a nine to five. Some people love a nine to five. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I told you, I, I crave a schedule sometimes. It would be great to just punch in and punch out sometimes right. instead of, you know, 1030 at night, I'm getting texts and I'm answering things because it's Australia and I need, they need an answer by this and, you know, interviews at one in the morning because it suits their time better. And I've got a meeting at 7 a.m. that I have to be, you crave that. I want to ching ching and ching ching and I'm done and I can go for a beer with my buddy and be home in time for dinner. It'd be great. But, you know, <laughs> it's not what's in your it's head. It's not what's in your head. It's, it's funny because, like, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about I have, I have friends of mine who are also musicians and they have, you know, they have jobs where they make, you know, 80, 100K, whatever a year. But, and it's like, you know, eight hours behind the desk or whatever. And most of my life, I spent going like, ah, oh, who would want to do that? But now as you're talking, I'm going, holy shit, those are the rock stars. It's true, Because man. they get eight hours a day that they have to do to make their living. The you rest of us idiots are ranging around banging our heads off the wall. And you can turn it off. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. So it's, it's weird. It's, it's a, it's a double edged sword because you don't want to turn it off. Right. But sometimes when you're feeling sorry for yourself, you want to turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you still get in those modes sometimes? Oh, dude, I'm, I'm the moodiest fucker around. My wife told me today, she's like, <laughs> you're like, this is what I want for Christmas. I'm like, I already got you a gift. Like, this is what I want. I want you to learn to settle down when things don't go the way you think they should be going. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, we got to New York and then the subway was late. And then, the one, and then it ruined your whole day. And I'm like, I know. Yeah, I know. 
So yeah, no, I'm a bitch, man. I, I bitch at shit all the time. And I get called for it. I think I'm mellowing out. Yeah. Like the older I get, like some things just don't bother me anymore. If you if you come at me with bullshit, I I literally just call it bullshit. I'm like, look, man, or look, ma'am, um, I love you and all, but that's shit, and I don't want anything to do with it. I'm sorry, it's bullshit. I just I don't have time. I don't no, it, it's that's, and then people should do to, that. It's refreshing. I I was good. I don't mean to jump on you, but that was actually something that stood out with me with all three of you guys. Yeah. Um, first time I'd ever met Stuart. First time I'd ever met Jeff. Uh, when we were in Montreal, but just. In the room, there's, I'm going to use the word arrogance, mm -hmm. but I'm misusing it. Yeah. Okay. Because it's confidence. It's confidence for sure. But it's, it's, it's a different thing than confidence because mm -hmm. it's a willingness to not be liked. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You develop a pretty thick skin. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's, it's like, oh, that's, and I just found that fascinating. Is that something that you guys like? consciously work that or I does think, it just happen to I you? I think it happens over the years. Yeah. You just get, oh Christ, you get salty, <laughs> right? Like like <laughs> the beard's growing in and it's gray. I don't give a shit. Like I used to be like, where's that just from out? <laughs> <laughs> or people's like, nice hair. I'm like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> like, but look at this. You can't go to nine to five with hair like this. But it's refreshing. <laughs> it's refreshing in a way because, like, like I said, I, I'm misusing the word arrogance. But it, there's a piece of it that that feels like arrogance until you understand all of the other pieces. Mm -hmm. around it. And I just, I wonder if that's. Well, yeah, I think it's maybe it's almost like because well, well, when you met them, um, it was it was middle of shit. We, yeah. yeah, like we flew in. We had different gear to use for that thing. Our manager showed up with. 400 of those executive producer things yep. to sign in Stewart's room. We had 400 albums to sign. It Jeff's was Jeff's wife was sick. Jeff's wife was sick. It was, you yeah. know, it's just a gong show. Yeah. And Jeff met his agent for his solo. It was just a bunch yeah. of moving parts. And, and then you want to be super gracious to any friends or fans that you promise tickets to. And, you know, you have to deal with them after the show or pre-show. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of moving parts that time compared to when you're on tour. It's like roll in on the bus, do this, right. go for a jog, you get to meet friends after the show. I'll see you. It's going to be right in there in the green room, and then you're done. And there's occasionally you got to do the autograph stuff right. and whatever, but that's a thrill and that's fine. But when it was that scheduled, it was it was that was funny. That was a crazy long day. Man. <laughs> well, and, and it was too because like that was I think because you you just flew in from Vancouver, but you would you were either just going to New York as well, like like the next day or something. No, or I went I went from Vancouver to there, back to Vancouver, then to New York. It was it was a gong show. So is that just is that just because you guys are like in the thick of it right now? Like yeah, there was a lot of prep to do with the album that comes out or has come out on the twenty nine, right? Um, with the vinyl stuff. Um, so yeah, that, but that's kind of like a typical day on tour, just without the flights and having to fly back, Right. you know what I mean? Which I don't mind at all because it takes up three hours of your time and it gives me something to do as opposed to do sound checks, sit around, go to sleep in your bunk or drink beer or, or you know, get high. You don't want to do any of that before you're doing a show. So, right. you know, it keeps you busy, so on and so forth. But then at the end of the show, you know, you can at least go to bed. You don't have to stay up or get up. I mean, Stuart and I got up at. 4.30 in the next morning to get on a 6 a.m. or 6.30 flight to go back to me. It was, you know, it was right. one of those days. <laughs> well, no, it's just... I, I think we were there 23 hours. <laughs> like, has that become part of your, like, a routine for you guys, though, with albums, though? Like, is, like, is that a normal build-up, or is there just something, like, did just catching you at a weird time? <laughs> that was weird timing. Okay. Because um, normally those albums and those cards that had to be done would have been shipped. Um, so they would have brought me to Toronto just to do it because they would have done something like this where I was doing something for socials and they would have used me for other things. And they literally would have shipped everything to Jeff and Stuart. But now that it's vinyl, our management was like, let's, you guys are going to be here. Let's just get it to Montreal. Yeah. So it worked out in a, in a good way. Um, it's a lot of logistics to everything. And that was, that was actually my next question because it's not just, it's not like it's just the tea party and then whatever, because Jeff's got his own things. You've got your own things and Stuart's got his own stuff. That's like a whole different world altogether. Yeah. It, the coordination of all of that, is that even on you guys anymore? A little bit. I mean, we're, we're still waiting on Jeff to get back to us on a conference call, um, in a couple days because we need to sort, um, the tour schedule that's coming up that is literally being booked right now from 
uh, the very beginning of summer to midsummer, and it's massive. Um, and uh, we needed to discuss Australia and Europe, like just you know, there's just tons of just things all the like basics, that. Right? Basics, logistics, you know, who were who were hiring for front house and teching and Australia tech. Is it worth bringing them back to Canada? Like. Just logistics. It's hilarious it's because and... I, I can read your mind. The yeah. audience is like, who cares what I care about yeah. this stuff? Like, this <laughs> stuff is fascinating to me yeah. because it's the it's the day-to-day -day stuff that it's like that you have to wrap your mind around. Well, those are, and those make or break shows too. I mean, the slightest thing can make or break a show. I mean, right. you get a phone, quick phone call and your kids are little and one of them's sick and, you know, they, they're they sleeping and you wanted to talk to them before. So like, it, it's those little types of things that, I mean, let alone the tea party, like big, big stars have to deal with that all the time, even though they have people polishing their shoes and making their dinners and massaging them before shows, there's still number one most important thing is usually their wife or their kids at home or their grandchildren or whatever, right? It's wife or husband for that matter. It, it, those are the types of things that make or break shows that are the, the little wrenches that'll make or break anyone's day. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to work or you're stuck on afternoons for two weeks and the kids came home and they failed the test before you know, you went to work and you helped them study and you don't understand how they fail and you're at work and you're, you know, it ruins your day. So you have to, when you're in a band and you're playing in front of 2,500 people or 2,000 people or whatever. You don't um, get to have a bad day up there. You, you know, you're, <laughs> this is the best time I'm providing you because, and, and it's true though, because there's, there's millionaires in the audience and there's people who are living check to check. And the last thing you fucking want to do is roll up. And, you know, I've got a man cold. I can't put, play a great show. No, fuck that. Get over it. That person is spending their every last penny and might not be going out with their wife this week. So you better give them a show because that's their night out. And that's, that's their entertainment budget for the month or two months. You never know. So you can't do that. I hate it when people do that on the shitty show. Or oh, it's do you, did, Was that a lesson you had to learn? No, I don't know where I heard it it was i think it was someone in the musicians union that said that to me once or or i read it somewhere is don't ever forget that people are paying really good money and whether they're millionaires or living check to check you owe them that they've they've paid money for a service mm -hmm. you're gonna be an asshole and be too fucked up to perform or an asshole because you're pissed at your bandmates like just get over it you can't you can't do that to people it's 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 rude it's not right and i don't know you're if you're a professional you need to be a professional and that's part of the code as far as i'm concerned i think that i think that's a great piece of advice for yeah. for a lot of musicians because you, you see that you see like up and comers a lot on yeah. stage will have little like and so why are you why are you doing that yeah dude we've played without <laughs> monitors yeah. my inner my inner monitors go right out pop it out and i got a screaming guitar in my ear mm. i'm still smiling right you know what i mean I'm half deaf now, but I'm still smiling. You don't do that. Everybody has shitty monitors sometimes. Everybody's ears go out. Everybody breaks a stick in the middle of a song. Everyone breaks a string in the middle of a solo. It, it just happens. It's, it, and it works the show. other way too, because like, I think the, the best moment, it wasn't just for me, but it definitely the best moment for me, but I know the rest of the crowd saw it too, was uh, when Gin Blossoms played Fork and Cork a couple of years ago. Uh, band, local band, Years of Earnest, Andrew McLeod. Uh, they're up playing, they were opening for him. And everything on the plant, the amp blew. Like at one point oh. it was smoking, right? And these guys, they're oh. local guys yeah. opening for the gin blossoms yeah. on this major stage. Yeah. And every, and you have to know Andrew. Andrew's a volatile dude. Yeah. All right. And I love Andrew. He's up on stage having the worst time of his life with a giant grin on yeah. his face, making it every step of the way. And every person in that audience was right there with him. Yeah. And it's like now you're on the journey. <clears throat> it's like we'll do this, bro. Let's, let's <laughs> as an audience, we're gonna kick ass too. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you 100%. love that. So, in the best of times, it's great when you have that reciprocal thing with an audience. And at the worst of times, if you if you make it bad, they're gonna they're gonna go with you. If yeah. you make it good, they'll go with you. They'll too. go with you too. So why not make a shit sandwich turn into like this beautiful hamburger? Right? You know what I mean? Like. Everybody has shit sandwiches now and then, and it, and it sucks, but, you know. So enough about the shit sandwiches. Let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about some of the best sandwiches that you get to eat ever. Let's talk about the Saints. Okay. Tell me, Saints tell me about how that came to be. Because we're, we're coming up on 10 years, right? Yeah, 10 years next year. Yeah. Um, 
this came to be, so Jody Rafool had worked with St. Clair College for five or six years preceding the Saints, doing concerts um, here and there, raising money and so on. And it was, it was fantastic. Um, a lady, a good friend of mine by the name of Lori Baldassi, she and I were both still at Blackburn Radio and she was community relations and I was on air and she was talking to Ron Segan, who's a senior vice president at St. Clair College, and he was the one who had brought Jody in a long time ago. And she was talking to him, and said, why don't we do something that between Jeff and Jody, whether it's a concert or this, and, and that's her job, community relations, which in turn has turned into my gig in so many other fields and, and, and different places now. So we went, had a meeting with Ron, and um, I had known Jody, and he had known me, like just to say hi, and so on and so forth, and we've become such great friends. Um, but, uh, we, we decided, okay, well, let's, let's just get together. Do you have a guitar player? And he's like, of course I've got Wes. And he's, I said, I got a bass player, Dave Seren, who's Stuart Chatwood's brother-in-law, who's a high school hero. He's two years older than me. Um, he married Stuart's sister, as a matter of fact. And then it just got better. What if we invited Mr. Chill? Like he still lives in Windsor and he, he was still working with uh, the Shugs at the time, but he had time and he made time. And then Jody said, there is this girl who I've seen, who is a genius. And so Kelly got, Oche got brought in of the Oches. Um, and then it just kept going and going. This Twisted Sisters ended up joining us. Um, we started rehearsing some songs and doing our own versions of things. And I think the first one might've been We Three Kings where we made it a bit of a, a Zeppi kind of thing. But then we discovered that let's not, we, first of all, we didn't even know if we were gonna do uh, an album. We just thought, let's do a concert. But then we were thinking, well, why don't we just record stuff? This would be great. So we talked to Ron, and and uh, Jody said, we got to get in touch with this kid, Marty Back, who was literally a kid at that time. I think he was maybe 20. And it was phenomenal. And um, we did our first four years uh, performing. We ended up doing album after album after album. First four at the um, St. Clair Center for the Arts. And um, Caesar saw how... Uh, successful it had been and um you know for a big corporation caesars believe it or not does a whole lot for a community i really i i do love that i've got so many friends that work there as well which makes it even easier um but they really do and they don't have to you know what i mean but they 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 make wins of their own even though they're a part of a big you know conglomerate um and they they offered you know why don't we do something here we'll help promote it even bigger we'll give you the stage for free you can come We'll be a part of your team. You'll be a part of our team. And it was just fantastic amalgamation. And then, so this is, I think, our sixth year? No, fifth year. Is that right? We did four? Yeah. This will be our fifth year performing there. And um, it's spectacular. So back to what I was talking about with the albums and such, we decided let's not do the whole album every year of just Christmas songs. You're going to run out for three years. First, we were even thinking, Maybe we can do this for three years. Then I looked at Jody. I think we can do it for five. And I'm like, dude, we're going 10. And now we're thinking 20, no problem, right? <laughs> um, but we had early on, we had decided. Um, to, to be fair, and this may be a little out of place, you were just talking with Jody about your kids taking over yeah, this yeah, thing yeah. too. So. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> so uh, we had decided early that you can't just do um, Christmas or holiday songs let's let's choose songs of hope or inspiration not religious in any way just songs that really bring you know that good vibe that good mm -hmm. feel and and mix it and so we decided you know let's create a concert that is just a feel good do good you know three quarters of it is christmas music in a rock genre or a, an uptake blues genre or whatever kind of thing but it's always going to be fun and you know, there's tears in the audience with some songs. It's 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 just really a great production. And the only thing we're finding it difficult now is just literally finding more Christmas songs because you run out of public domain songs. Right. And so now it's like we have a meeting every January <laughs> at um, over at um, the Kildare House upstairs. Every January we all meet and uh, have drinks and just lay out 70 songs and then no, no, no. Yes. Everybody voting on a yes. Okay. Well, asterisk that one sort of thing. Um, and here we are. Um, we've raised money for, it started out, we, we, we did hospice for the first year. 
The second year, there was a, a um, local, not local, but there was a local branch of Camp Bucko, which was children uh, burn victims. Horrifying. Jesus. Um, 10,000 for them. And then it, as it just kept growing, and uh, again, back into the community, started getting in touch with people like June Muir of uh, uh, the Unemployed Help Center. And in the meantime, I was doing can drives in LaSalle and Windsor and Chatham, because I always wanted, I got a soft spot for Chatham, my, my folks being from there. I was doing um, lots there, and I met a lady by the name of Brenda LeClaire, and she runs a, a project called Outreach for Hunger in Chatham, and it's grassroots, and you know, my older uncle still goes there and volunteers and stock shelves where he's a big guy and tall and, you know, helps, helps that sort of thing. So now uh, we've raised over a million dollars for food banks. So the Unemployed Help Center, um, that service is the Windsor, whatever it's called, the Windsor Food Bank Association, sort of, okay. whatever it's called. And there's like 18 different branches of it from Harrow to Essex to LaSalle to Amherst. And they're kind of like Edmonton. a main hub. To they're the umbrella and they spread it out. And you know, every year, I think, I mean, last year we did 65,000. Uh, this year we're aiming for 70, 75,000. So it's phenomenal. And then we keep the pr ticket prices. I, I remember me suggesting raising the ticket prices from 20 to 25 last year, because I said, look, if you can afford 20, you can afford 25. And if you have 4,000 people times five bucks, that's another $20,000. Yeah. So we, we literally went from making 45 to 65 like that. So, and now we're starting to sell more tickets and it's becoming easier, you know? Um, people know it as a holiday tradition, almost like, um, what's the Trans-Siberian Orchestra? Oh, they know yeah, it's right. coming to town, so right. they kind of keep their ears open. So now our work really is just to get the word out. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, doing podcasts and, and, you know, hitting the CBC and all the print media and the college alumni share. And then of course, Caesars and their dynamic uh, marketing machine right. um, put things out, but you know we do videos with them. Uh, you know, it, it's just it, it's turned into this crazy event that gets a little bit easier. But again, it's still very grassroots because it's, and every year you try to top yourselves too, right? It's not yeah. like you're just going out to put on the same show over and over. No, again. no, no. Every year, different set lists, different yeah. everything. Um, we've got special guests again this year that are different. Ten year, the ten year anniversary show is going to be crazy that'll sell out it better sell out <laughs> um but yeah it's amazing you know last year we had 4400 4400 people come from windsor in the community uh, surrounding communities i don't know if people realize how hard it is to sell 500 tickets to anything in windsor to, like, it's to that a point, difficult talk about task. talk because we're, we've talked about tea party up to now mm -hmm. one of the things that you and i've talked about and, and it's no secret the Tea Party can go to Australia mm -hmm. and fill a stadium. Mm -hmm. You have a hard time filling a, a smaller venue here in the city. Well, yeah. maybe not now, but like yeah. at, at the time. Yeah. And it's yeah. weird like that, right? Yeah, it's it's strange. I mean, sometimes, you know, people call it the kiss of love, you know, the hometown <laughs> kiss of love. Cause, and that happens to a lot of bands. And, yeah, I, I, honestly, I, I don't mind because it's allowed me to live here without <laughs> right. being I just, But I just mean like that, like that goes to show you how difficult, like it's not like you can just like walk down the street and be like, hey, I got a show tomorrow and three and 30,000 people show. No, yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's a very different, um, well, that's what makes Windsor Windsor too, too right. right? It's, it's, they're choosy. And you're living across from the eighth largest city in America who has the top notch everything right. from four sports teams to, you know, all of the entertainment from small theater, mid theater, large theater, stadiums, arenas, you know, everything is right there. So, you know, you can't really complain, but the nice thing about it with the Saints is it's growing exponentially. Like every year there's another four or 500 people that come to a show. You know, we went from 39 to 44 last year. If we go to 49, we're like a hundred from selling out freaking Caesars Coliseum, which Kiss sells up. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. It's phenomenal to me because we're just a bunch of local guys and gals that love doing something and uh, get to be a part of something bigger. You know, we're not looking for the pat on the back or anything, but it's good to be a part of a, a process. And again, it's bigger than the band. The band is one component of the St. Clair College, the St. Clair College alumni. Like these entities afford us money to even do it in the first place in order to make money for the charities. And in turn, of course, they get advertising out of it, and then Caesars get great advertising out of it. But they go beyond by giving us the stage 
two or three days before a show. No one does that. Right. No one. I mean, this is the best stage mid-size theater in North America. Everyone knows that it. it's been happening for 10 years in a row now. And, you know, they're, they're very generous, very gracious. And, you know, we're, we're lucky as hell because everybody gets to play on a big stage. And the first time we got to do that, other than Jody and I, no one, or, and, and Mr. Chill, no one had ever played on a stage. big stage like right. that. And it's, you know, the lights are going and their staff, I mean, you know, insane. Dan, the, the light technician, just, he gets our set list. He's got it already like a month ahead and he's already programming the show in order to give the audience who are paying money to give money to the charity, get this fantastic show. Like it, there's a lot of moving parts. So. I, I got to be honest, shout out to the, to the lighting techs at, at Caesars Windsor. Best photos I've ever taken in my life yeah. were of Howie Mandel. Yeah. And, and it was because of the lighting guys at Caesars. It had nothing to do avoiding with the red, Avoiding the reds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just pull them down just a tad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no. So shout out to those guys yeah. for sure. Yeah. But it's still grassroots, right? Yeah. Like I'm, in, I'm at the mall and a bunch of the saints are joining me on Friday because we're selling, you can get your tickets for $25 flat if you don't want to spend the extra 10 that Ticketmaster charges you or right. 11 that Ticketmaster charges you. Um, so you can go to the mall, get them, you know, there at their information center. I'm there on Friday with a bunch of the other saints. Um, you can go right to the box office or order them online, but you're going to pay that fee. But some people just don't care. They right. just, I got them. I'm ready to go. All right. One last question for you here. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up. You've been talking about community talked about your career you kind of came back to community with the stuff you yeah. did with the saints yeah for anybody who's watching this yeah that's sitting back and saying they want to they want to build a career in entertainment mm -hmm. what's the piece of advice that you can give them that they can start working on right now right now so not necessarily musicians anything right anybody anything um knowledge start learn how to be your own manager Learn how to be your own agent. Learn how to do your press properly. Learn how to market yourself properly. Anyone can market yourself themselves, but it, most of the time it's done poorly and you're hitting the same target audience. You need to read, which is a lost art, and figure things out for yourself in order, like as an example, because it's the only thing I've got, the Tea Party, we were our own management. We were our own agent. We, were, we used to drive to London, to Toronto, to drop off our CDs at all of the radio or record shops, you know, back then. And it was only the indies. And we would travel to all the indie radio stations at Western University, CJM, U of T, anywhere and everywhere. You need to be a wealth of knowledge with most aspects of your business. So when you meet someone and they're talking about, you know, and, and it's your time and you put in the work and now things are about to get going and they're they start talking about whether it's a contract or whether they're promoting a tour or whether this you're not left in the dark you know exactly what you're doing because you've done it for two three years and it's your schooling i mean there's more than one way to make a living you can go to school and if i mean you know anything from trades to plumbing to being a doctor to being a teacher all of those are great and it's awesome and you go to school for it and you pay attention and if you're really good at it you'll do really well well, going into the entertainment industry is the same thing, only there's not really a school for it. I mean, you can go to school and technical school and learn how to be a front house person or an in-studio engineer or this or that or whatever. But if you're looking for those other types of things, that is your schooling. I mean, I, the prime example is my son in New York. There's no post-secondary knowledge. That, that He's a genius at what he does. And I'm not just saying that because he's my kid, because everyone knows if if you spend that, you know, 18 hours a day doing something and working with different people over and over you become a master at that if the passion is there that's there's more than one way to skin a cat and to to be successful at what you do uh school is awesome trade school is awesome but if you want to be in the entertainment business you need to be a wealth of knowledge like in here and um and don't take no for an answer it's been such a pleasure my friend yeah bro you know, click the things, hit the likes, do all the stuff you're supposed to do. See you guys. <laughs>